Hello and welcome to Reflections on the Rock here at Covenant United Methodist Church here in Rochester, New York. I am Bob Kern and with me tonight is Bruce McDaniel and tonight we're going to be looking at a few passages in Romans chapter 11. Basically the lectionary has a few passages designated but we will of course do an overview of the entire mm -hmm. chapter. And to start out this evening we will start with I Come to the Cross. Let us pray, and our opening prayer is based on the words to that hymn. I come to the cross seeking mercy and grace. I come to the cross where you died in my place. Out of my weakness and into your strength, humbly I come to the cross. Amen. Our scripture reading tonight is from Romans chapter 11 verses 1 to 2a and 29 to 32. And this is Paul writing. Yep. I ask then, has God rejected his own people, the nation of Israel? Of course not. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. No, God has not rejected his own people, whom he chose from the very beginning. For God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. Once, you Gentiles were rebels against God, but when the people of Israel rebelled against him, God was merciful to you instead. Now they are the rebels, and God's mercy has come to you, so that they too will share in God's mercy. For God has imprisoned everyone in disobedience so he could have mercy on everyone. So the Apostle Paul likes to ask a question and then immediately answer it himself. Mm -hmm. So he asks, has God rejected God's own people, the nation of Israel? Right. Uh, the, the Jewish people had rejected the prophets, mm -hmm. had rejected Jesus, and because of their rejection, of those sent by God, Paul ponders hmm, whether God has in turn rejected them. That would be a logical conclusion, but Paul rejects it, mm -hmm. saying that's not how God operates. If God chose the Israelites, he wasn't going to unchoose them, if that's a word, unchoose. It's not like online, online shopping where you see something and you click on it, and then you change your mind, so you unclick it. And then it goes away and gets removed from your cart. Unfortunately, there have been people down through the ages, including preachers and Bible scholars, who thought the Jews were unworthy of salvation because they had crucified their own Messiah. Preachers cited how the Roman armies had destroyed Jerusalem in A.D. 70 as proof of the Jews being cut off from God. And even an American Bible scholar in 1938 predicted that Israel would never be restored. Now, preaching like that, of course, only fueled the hatred of the Nazis in the 30s and 40s, leading to the extermination of millions of Jews in World War II. But even though all those millions died, was Judaism wiped out? No. And despite that Bible scholar predicting that Israel would not be restored, Israel, the modern nation of Israel, was created in 1948. 
Jews are still practicing their faith. A Jewish remnant still survives. So we can't go by human predictions. We have to rely on God's promises. God did not unchoose the Jews. Instead, God decided to choose more. Instead of kicking people out of the fold, God invited more people in. The Gentiles were not looking for a Messiah, but they were invited to be a part of his kingdom anyhow. God's mercy and grace are thus available to even more people. And in other letters and chapters, Paul compares this to being adopted into a family and becoming children of God. In this chapter, Romans 11, Paul uses the analogy of grafting branches onto a tree. The new branches become part of the original plant. Verses, verse 17 of this chapter says, Some of these branches from Abraham's tree some of the people of Israel, have broken off. And you Gentiles, who were branches from my wild olive tree, have been grafted in. So now also you receive the blessing God has promised, Abraham and his children, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. And so what kind of tree does Paul mentioned an olive tree. Now, do you think Paul selected that because he is writing to the Romans? Hmm. Now, area of Rome is in the Mediterranean, and they do grow lots of olives. And olives and olive oil are certainly part of the economy. And extra virgin olive oil is still a very important part of Italian cuisine. But no, though, that's not what Paul had in mind. When you extend the olive branch, you extend friendship. You extend peace. Now recall that Jews and Gentiles didn't exactly get along in Paul's day. Paul's job was to bring people to Christ. That meant reconciling God and humans. But his job was also reconciling Jews and Gentiles, whether he viewed it that way or not. Now, this ties into the unity that Bruce Mm -hmm. spoke of on Wednesday, and it'll also touch on what Pastor Ann will talk about on Sunday. A Gentile woman who begs that her daughter be healed, even though Jesus at that time was only focusing on ministering to Jews. So why did God expand salvation to include both Jews and Gentiles? Because God's love and compassion for people extends far beyond just the chosen. To quote an old hymn, and I do mean old, it's from 1872, Mm -hmm. Frederick W. Faber says, there's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in God's justice, which is more than liberty. For the love of God is broader than the measure of our mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. And Paul had a desire to see something happen. Now, I'm not quite, quite sure I'm, I'm totally in sync with his reasoning on this, but I understand where he's coming from. He says earlier in this letter, in the first verse of Romans 10, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. Paul knows that Jesus saves, so he thinks he has God's plan figured out. So now let's go back to tonight's focus chapter, chapter 11, and hear Paul speaking in verses 13 through 15. God has appointed me as the apostle to the Gentiles. I stress this, for I want somehow to make the people of Israel jealous of what you Gentiles have, so I might save some of them. For since their rejection meant that God offers salvation to the rest of the world, their acceptance would be even more wonderful. It will be life for those who are dead. 
That's an interesting strategy, isn't it? Make people want Jesus because others have Jesus. Yeah. Strangely enough, sometimes that works. Now, I don't go around evangelizing or, you know, wearing my faith on my sleeve, but I would like to see that, you know, that, that light of Christ emanates from me. Well, one time a coworker said that she wanted what I had. She wanted to feel the joy and peace that surpasses all understanding. She wanted the fruit of the Spirit because she saw that I had it. So that led her to join a church of her choosing. Now, I did not ask her to come to my church at the time. She chose one near her that she felt comfortable with. It's important to invite people to Christ, lead them to Christ, not necessarily invite them to your church, but as long as they seek God and Christ someplace, that's, that's the whole um, emphasis of it. And so we are to bear good fruit. We are to graft more branches into that olive tree. So again, I'm not quite sure that Paul's strategy of jealousy always works, but it does sometimes. And that's how he reasoned that the Gentiles might preserve the Jewish remnant. Okay, now fast forward to our time. Who is one of the biggest supporters of the modern nation of Israel? That would be the United States, a predominantly Christian country. Now, why do Americans support Israel? Now, our belief in freedom of religion certainly plays a role. But Christianity's, Christianity's roots are Jewish. We want to protect the roots of that olive tree into which we have been grafted. And so we come to Israel's aid when appropriate. So yes, God uses Gentiles to protect the Jews, the original chosen people. Now Paul could not have fathomed that. In fact, in verse 33, which is right after tonight's scripture reading, he says, Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand God's decisions and God's ways. But here's something we can understand. God is all about granting mercy. Mercy has two parts. One, forgiveness and the withholding of punishment. And this usually relates to sin and wrongdoing. And number two, compassion for those who suffer with an ailment or a need or are going through tough times. So God can't just dish out mercy to the chosen people and ignore the rest of humanity. That wouldn't fit a loving creator. God's mercy extends to all who turn to the divine. Let's hear tonight's passage in a different translation. Listen to verses 30 to 32 from The Voice. There was a time when you outsiders were disobedient to God and at odds with God's purpose. But now you have experienced mercy as a result of their disobedience. In the same way, their disobedience now will make a way for them to receive mercy as a result of the mercy shown to you. For God has assigned all of us together, Jews and non-Jews, insiders and outsiders, to disobedience so that God can show mercy to all. Now that last verse there, verse 32, with its reference to being bound or imprisoned to disobedience, is difficult to understand, or at least difficult for me to understand. And most Bible translations just don't help me. But it turns out there is one that does. It's called the message. Here's how that translation phrases it. In one way or another, God makes sure that we all experience what it means to be outside so God can personally open the door 
and welcome us back in. I think that's at the heart of the, the message here, that it's all about um, being grafted into the family of God, or the image of the olive tree, and reconciliation between God and human and each other. And so therefore, God has not rejected the chosen people. The Jews make up that original olive tree, and the tree gets pruned every so often, so the bad branches are removed. But the devout, who cling to God and have good roots, continue in the fold of God. And more branches are added as people put their belief and trust in God. And Paul maintains that those additional branches are placed there by the saving power of Jesus Christ. So not only are we offered the olive branch, we are the olive branch that gets grafted into the tree of life. And it's up to us to flourish and be faithful to the God who provides abundant and eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so um, the image of the olive tree with its symbolism of peace, and as we talked about on Wednesday, unity fits in with the idea of um, being right with God and being right with each other. Okay. Amen. Well, we come to our time of prayer. Our prayer music tonight will be Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, my soul, and bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, my soul, who leads me into life. Gracious and loving God, we lift our hearts to you in praise. Your love pervades the whole creation. You give us life. You call us sons and daughters. You are the one we turn to, the one in whom we find peace. And so, knowing you are already present, we bring our requests before you. Bring wholeness to those who face sickness in body or mind, and strengthen and encourage all those who bear the burden of caring for others. We especially ask your healing care for Ernest, waiting for a heart, for Pat, undergoing cancer treatment, for Kim, diagnosed with breast cancer, for Chris, prayers for strength and encouragement for her, and for Julie, with her health issues. We pray that each of this, these people and the others who we do not name, who are in need of healing and encouragement, we pray that, that they would find that in you and know that you are truly present. And we have other requests. Comforting God, assure those who are grieving of your sustaining presence. Give hope to those suffering losses from fires, floods, or other natural disasters, and strengthen those who help in places of need. And at this time, we certainly think of the people in Hawaii and the great needs that they have. Lead us out of the hopelessness and violence that plague our community. And loving God, enlarge our hearts to welcome those who are isolated or lonely so that all might find their place of belonging. 
grateful for the new life we experience in Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit at work among us, we pray in the words our Savior taught us, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. So it has been a busy day here at the church. This was uh, our new to you sale day, and people found a lot of bargains, and we had great conversations with folks. And um, even though um, a lot of merchandise was sold, uh, we still have some left over, and so tomorrow uh, we will just give it away. I'm coming. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so um, Good Neighbor Day is tomorrow, Saturday, um, the 19th, in case you're watching this any other time. And if you're watching this some other time, you may have missed it. <laughs> but in any case, great bargains galore as we um, give things to uh, um, folks in the neighborhood on Good Neighbor Day, August 19th. And then coming up on Sunday, uh, the pastor will be preaching on Matthew 15, 21 to 28. And that's the faith of a Gentile or Canaanite woman and we will see how that relates to what we've been talking about this week, unity and the um, grafting of the um, olive tree and all of that, how that relates together. And um, it really does. And then looking ahead for the next holiday, uh, Labor Day, uh, we will need volunteers to do um, serving and cooking, etc., for Covenant Table on Labor Day. And so um, if you can help with that, keep that in mind. And that will mean that um, our regular volunteers have the holiday off. And so we were asking others to step in so that, um, I mean, when you're hungry, you're hungry. It doesn't make any difference whether it's a holiday or not. Right. So um, we try to make sure that for consistency's sake, we do serve a meal every Monday. And so um, if you can help with that, keep that um, in mind and let us know. And as we go into this evening, reflecting on what Paul has said and the idea of mercy, let us hear for our benediction the words to a song. Mm -hmm. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. Amen. Amen. Sunday, either online or in person, for Sunday worship at 10. Good night. <laughs>